Today we're going to talk about systems of linear equations and their relationship to matrices. So let's start by looking at this little 2 by 2 matrix of coefficients 3, 4, 2, 1. And let's imagine it multiplies this column matrix of the variables x and y. So if you remember, you take a dot product, okay? First row with first column is going to give you 3x plus 4y. Second row with first column is going to give you 2x plus y. So if we write this matrix times xy equals 2, 3, that's really the same as saying 3x plus 4y, 2x plus y equals 2, 3, which is exactly the same as saying 3x plus 4y equals 2, 2x plus y equals 3, which is exactly this system of equations. Now, for terminology, 3, 4, 2, 1 is called the matrix of coefficients. This AB here is called the column of constants. Both of these things are called column vectors because they have multiple components, but there's only one column. And the shorthand notation for this is we call this matrix A. This is X, this is B, so you can either write it as A, X equals B, or in a vector notation, A, X as a vector equals little b as a vector. So the idea is this is a column vector of variables, this is a column vector of constants, and this is your matrix of coefficients. Now, what we want to talk about today is how you solve such a system. And I'm going to look here at a 3 by 3. And we've got here 1, 2, 1 is the coefficients equals 4. So this is our matrix of coefficients right here corresponding to the left-hand side of these equations. And here is our column of constants. This thing is called an augmented matrix. It has all the information that's in this system of equations, realizing that this is the x column, that's the y column, this is the z column, and that's the constant column. And it's actually easier to work with an augmented matrix than it is with the system of equations. So what operations can you do with systems of equations? Well, we've already seen that you can add or subtract a multiple of one equation from another. So let's talk about taking this equation and subtracting it from that one. Okay, what we end up with here is when we subtract here, we get a zero. When we subtract here, we get a minus y. When we subtract here, we get a z. And when we subtract here, we get a minus one, which is what you see right there. The third equation hasn't changed. Now, if we write it in terms of the augmented matrices, all we're doing is subtracting the first row from the second row. And this is re represented as row 2 is replaced by row 2 minus row 1. And when you do that, what you can see is you get 0, minus 1, 1, minus 1. And that's what we've got represented here. And this is notationally more pleasant. Now, what operations can we do? Well, one of the things we can do is we can switch two rows. And that has no effect at all on the solution because this was we thought of this as the first equation and that the second equation. Now we're thinking about this one as the first equation and that is the second equation. You can multiply a row by a non-zero constant. We've seen this before. You take an equation, you multiply it by non-zero constant, you don't change the solution set. And then finally, what we already did, you can subtract a multiple of one row from another. You can also add a multiple of one row to another. And the objective of all of this is to use the op these operations to get a system where we can read off the answer. Okay, so we're going to start with simple examples for two by two matrices. And 
uh, two by two systems. And here we've got x plus three y equals seven, two x minus y equals seven, which when we write in the augmented matrix form is one, three, seven, two minus one, seven, x column, y column, constant column. Now, if you look at these two, you can see that they are two non-parallel lines. So the solution will be a single point. Now, what we're going to do is describe a mechanism for getting there using matrix manipulation. It's going to be uh, called Gauss-Jordan elimination. And it's going to look complicated to begin with. Solving this two by two is not hard by methods you know already, but the idea is to illustrate this so that when you use it with three by three or higher, uh, you'll be able to see what to do. And for bigger systems, it's a systematic way to solve this. Okay, so first thing to do is to find a non-zero entry in column one, and there's a one in the top spot. That'll do just fine. Switch rows so that that non-zero entry is in the top row. It already is. Divide the row by that entry so it becomes a one. And it's going to always be important that eventually this thing that we use is a one. And it already is. And now that we got a one up there in the first row, first column, we're going to use it to get rid of the entries in the rest of the column. So the second row, first column is a two. We're gonna subtract two times row one from row two to make the A21 entry zero. So we take this thing, two times this is two, six, 14. You subtract, you get zero. Six subtracted from minus one is minus seven and 14 subtracted from seven is minus seven. So we end up with this, row two is replaced by row two minus twice row one, and we get one, three, seven, zero, minus seven, minus seven. And notice that now the only entry in row one that's, or pardon me, in column one that's not zero is this one. And that means that the only equation with an x in it comes from the first row. A11 equals 1 is actually what we call a leading one. And when we are done, every non-zero row will have a leading one as its first non-zero entry. And we move to column 2, and we find a non-zero entry not in row 1, okay? Because we want to keep this equation for the time being. It's the only thing that's got an x in it. Uh, so we want to use other things to clear out the second column. What we can see here is there's a minus seven here. We're going to use that as our entry that's going to give us a leading one. So we divide row two by seven to get that leading one. And we're going to end up with zero, one, one. Now every row now has a leading one as its first non-zero entry. We use these leading ones to zero out the things above them in the column. Now, this particular case, that one needs to zero out this three. So we're going to take this row, multiply it by three, and subtract it from the top row. And that's going to give me one, zero. And there's a three here, subtracted from the seven, we're going to get a four. So row one replaced by row one minus three row two is one zero four zero one one. Now, if you look at this, you can read off the solution. X plus zero Y is four, or X is four, and zero X plus Y equals one, or Y equals one. Okay, now, that's not the only thing that can happen. So let's look at this system, X plus three Y equals five and x plus 3y equals 7. These are parallel lines. They don't intersect. So there's not going to be a solution. So we start off, we've got our leading one exactly where we want it anyway. 
So let's subtract row 1 from row 2. So row 2 is replaced by row 2 minus row 1, and we get 1, 3, 5, 0, 0, 2. Now this is a special sort of an equation. You got zeros on this side and something non-zero on that side. So you read 0x plus 0y equals 2, which is impossible. And when you see something like this, it's telling you there is no solution to this system. So that's when that's how our system is going to tell us there's no solution. You get an equation with all zeros on this side and something non-zero on the other. Okay, let's look at a third example. This time our equations are 2x plus 6y equals 2 and x plus 3y equals 1, which you'll notice are the equations of the same line. Okay, so these two equations are describing a line and not a point of intersection. The augmented matrix we get is 2, 6, 2, 1, 3, 1. We want to get a leading one in the top position. We could do this a couple of ways. We could divide the top row by two, but what I'm gonna do is switch the two rows and we get the following. Now what we do is we subtract twice row one from row two and we end up with the following matrix. Now what you'll notice is we've got all zeros is our last row and there is no way to look in this second column and find a leading one. So we're actually done at this point and what we have here is a column that doesn't have a leading one in it. It's called a free column. And in the solution, it's going to correspond to a free parameter. So this is the y column. We're going to set y equal to s, which is a free parameter. And then we're going to look at this equation right here, which tells us about x. It says x plus 3y is 1. Remember that y is s, so that gives us x plus 3s is 1. x is thus 1 minus 3s and y is s for s being an r. So there are infinitely many solutions here. Okay, now we can rewrite it in a variety of different ways. Okay, so x, y, that column vector is 1 minus 3s, s. And it's sometimes a good idea to separate it into a constant column and then everything involving parameters. So the constants are 1, 0. The parameters are minus 3s, s, and you can see these two add to that. And now I factor an s out of that last one, and we have 1, 0 plus s times minus 3, 1. Okay, now it's time to talk about the algorithm that I've been using to get these matrices in the forms where we can read off the solutions. And this is the uh, Gauss-Jordan elimination algorithm. So the idea is the following. Start at the first column, and we're going to go column by column in the matrix of coefficients. We have to find a non-zero entry in the column that is not in a row that it already has a leading one used previously. So this is not an issue in column one, but when we get to column two, we cannot be using the first row, which will have a leading one in it. Okay, so we find a non-zero entry that's not in a row that has a leading one in it, and we move that entry right below the last row that has a leading one, and we do that by switching rows. Then we divide that row by the entry so that that entry becomes one, which is now going to be our leading one. Now we use this entry to zero out all the other entries in the column that are below the one. And now we proceed to the next column. If there's a non-zero entry we can use, we repeat this process. If not, we go to the next column 
and see whether that's got something we can use as a leading one. If in the process we ever get a row that's all zeros, but the constant term corresponding is not zero, we stop because that's zero equals non-zero, so there's no solution. After we finish all the columns, we go backwards from the last column to the first, using the leading one to zero in out entries above. To illustrate the method, let's look at a slightly more complicated system of equations. This is going to be three by three. And here is the augmented matrix that corresponds to that. You'll notice that the entry in the 1, 1 position is already 1. We'll use that as our leading 1. And the first step is to clear out everything below it. So we take this first row, multiply it by 4, and subtract. Okay, and 2 is subtracted from 2. 4 is subtracted from 4. Minus 2 is subtracted from 2. 2 is subtracted from 6. And we get 0, 0, 4, 4 as our second row. Now we're going to use this same leading one to get rid of the five. So this thing gets multiplied by five and subtracted. And five subtracted from five is zero. Ten subtracted from ten is zero. Uh, minus five subtracted from three is eight. And five subtracted from thirteen is eight. So we get this as our new augmented matrix. Now what we notice is that the second column, which we're supposed to look at for a candidate for a leading one, has nothing. The only non-zero entry is in the first row. We can't use that because that's a row with a leading one. So we proceed to the third column. We see this four is non-zero and we can use it. It's already in the right position. So let's just divide this row by four which we do, row two is one quarter, row two, zero, zero, one, one. This is our leading one. Now we want to clear the stuff in this column below that. So we multiply this row by eight and subtract, and we get all zeros in the bottom, which is perfectly fine. That's the equation zero equals zero, which doesn't tell us much other than we don't have an inconsistent system. Okay, now the next step is to go back, use this leading one to clear out the stuff above. So pretty clearly, all we have to do is add this row to this row. So row one is replaced by row one plus row two. And what we're going to get here is a zero and a two. And so we've got one, two, zero, two. And now we're done because every row that has a leading, every row that's non-zero has a leading one in it. Every column that has a leading one in it has all zeros in it elsewhere. Okay, so let's see what these equations say. The y column, which is column two, is a free column, and that's going to correspond to a free parameter, y equals s. This equation reads z equals one. This equation reads x plus two y equals two. And remember, y is s, so x plus two s equals two, which means x is two minus two s. Now we can write that in vector form or column form. X, Y, Z is two minus two S, S one. Typically we like to separate that out into constant stuff and stuff times parameters. So the constant stuff is two, zero, one. The stuff involving the parameter is minus two S, S zero. And we factor that S right out of that. So the coefficient matrix that we finally worked with is what's called in reduced row echelon form. And what that means is exactly what I said before, right? The leading one, there's a leading one in every row other than the zero rows. The leading ones move right as you move down. And every column that has a leading one in it has zeros elsewhere, okay? And the zero rows, if they're any place, are at the bottom of the matrix. So if we look, this matrix, and 
you do not have to have a square matrix to put it in reduced row echelon form is, right? The, the leading ones move right. Everything in a column with a leading run is zero otherwise. And this thing actually here is a free column. Uh, there are no restrictions on leading ones or anything there. Now, if we stare at this one, we can see this one is not in reduced row echelon form. Every row does, in fact, have a leading one. They move to the right. But notice this leading one has a three in the same column. So to make this in reduced row echelon form, we'd have to take this row, multiply by three, and subtract it from this row, and then we would be in reduced row echelon form.